One of them was called the path to home, but you don't get that one because that was really a salvation. It was for visitors. So we're going to do this other one. I've done this one before. And it's called A Tale of Two Visitations. And um, Cornelius is described as a devout, God-fearing man. But Acts chapter 10, 33 says, So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Would you bow your heads with me again? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look into these morsels from your word, and we pray that you will guide and direct the word right into the hearts where you intend it to go, and that, you would, that it will have the effect that you cause it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. This play takes place in Caesarea. There were at least two cities named Caesarea in the first century A.D. The first one was located near the springs that fed the Jordan River and was visited by Jesus and his disciples. You can find that in Matthew 16, 13. It was the place where the apostle Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah of mankind. You can find that in Luke chapter 9. The other city named Caesarea Maritima can be found on the shores of the Mediterranean. It is where the prophet Agabus uh, prophesied in Acts 21.10. He prophesied there that Paul would be arrested and the place where the apostle was left to languish in prison for more than two years. This Caesarea was also where a Roman centurion named Cornelius lived and became the first non-Jewish convert to Christianity. You can find that in Acts chapter 10. Matter of fact, I'll read it, Acts 10, 1 to 3. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, hey, there's a guy I know haven't seen for quite a while. <laughs> Steve, it's good to see you. So then we pick it up in verse 4. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Verse 7, then the angel who spoke to him had, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. While they're on the way to Joppa, Peter had his famous vision in which he saw a sheet, you know this story, lowered from heaven. Pick it up in Acts 10 and pick it up in verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, that is the city of Joppa, to go to Paul, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and had wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. 
Surely not, Lord Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. God was telling Peter to share the gospel with Gentiles, who the Jewish believers had a bias against Gentiles and considered them to be unclean. So then we go down to verse 27. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. This was a major turning point in the early church. God was opening the gospel to all who would receive it. Cornelius is thought of as the first Gentile convert. Although this is after the encounter uh, of the Ethiopian eunuch with Stephen. In verse number two, Cornelius is described as devout, God-fearing, generous, and a man of prayer. He was not a born-again Christian at this point, and he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. Where do these characteristics come from? He was devout. A definition of devout is committed or devoted to religion or to religious duties or exercises. Of course, you know that what we do is not religion. This is not religion. Religion is destructive. Religion is destructive. This is not religion. This is faith. We practice a faith. We have a relationship with God. It's not religion. So the example here in that definition is a devout Catholic. That is religion, by the way. Cornelius was by definition religiously devoted. He was by choice, heart and soul, sold out. Number two, he was God-fearing. Apparently Cornelius and his family were God-fearing people. Their devotion was to the one true God. He must have been exposed to Judaism and the doctrine of the one true God. He was drawn toward the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Romans were pantheistic, the Romans. They accepted multiple gods. Judaism was monotheistic, accepting only one God, the creator of heaven and earth the great Yahweh. As a centurion, Cornelius would have been able to explore the culture of the population of the region that he was assigned to. The third thing was he was generous. He gave to those in need. Almsgiving was seen as a virtue by the Jews at that time. Being generous is something believers are happy to do. In verse 4, we see that his prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a monument, as a mo memorial, that is, offering before God. A memorial offering, an offering that is remembered by God. Then the fourth thing, he was a man of prayer. Cornelius prayed to God regularly. The vision came to him at three o'clock in the afternoon. Three in the afternoon was a traditional time of prayer for the Jews. He was copying the religious activity that he saw being carried on by the Jewish people. They prayed from at 9 a.m., at noon, and at 3 p.m. Those were the three times they went to prayer. And this was his three o'clock prayer time. So that's Cornelius. Then on the other side was Peter. Peter was the impetuous fisherman who became a preacher in Acts chapter 2. He was also a man of prayer. Cornelius was praying. Peter was praying. 
He was at prayer at noon, one of the three times the Jewish people prayed. Peter also had a vision. Verse 10 said he was hungry, wanted something to eat. So he had this vision of the sheet containing animals. God was impressing Peter not to think of non-Jews as unclean. At that time, the Jewish Christians thought the Gentiles should become Jews first by being circumcised, thereby becoming clean, and then they would be available to become Christian. That's what they thought. God is turning that whole thing around right here with these two visions. Pick it up in verse um, 15 of Acts chapter 10. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, and they stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. <laughs> So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to them, I'm the man, the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who was respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him, to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. An invitation to carry the gospel. Wow. God's will was that Cornelius would become a Christian. Not only Cornelius, but his family and friends as well. He had sent those three friends to go get Peter. When God calls us out of darkness into his glorious light, he expects us to share salvation. He expects us to be gospel carriers. God's first will for every person is that they become born-again believers. That's his will for every person. Peter himself would write, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's God's will for every person. He doesn't force his will on anyone. Peter was equipped. In verse 22, it says, what you have to say. Cornelius wanted to know what Peter would say. What the believer has to say is a treasure beyond compare. What you as a believer have to say to someone that's hungry for God, you have something that is a treasure beyond compare. Peter's words in the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter knew. And now Peter had the words of eternal life. Those are the words of eternal life. And you have them too. Peter is the one empowered by the Holy Spirit to go boldly forth and speak the words that will bring light into darkness. Words do that. The words in the Bible do that, and the words that come from the heart of a believer bring light into darkness. 
will save from sin. Words that will break the power of Satan in someone's life. These are the you must be born again words that Jesus spoke. These are the repent and be baptized words that Peter spoke. These are the Jesus loves you words that you speak. And now in you and I have the words of eternal life. We have the words. Cornelius needs to hear those words. He and those with him are in desperate need. They need Jesus. We are all in desperate need until the words of life come to us. I didn't even have to push my button. Thank you. <laughs> we have no hope in all of eternity unless we are set free from the law of sin and death. We don't know how to do that until we hear about it. We don't know the message until someone speaks it to us. Romans 10, 11 to 15, as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You want beautiful feet? <laughs> bring good news. Peter had the words. We have the words. Peter had a vision. Cornelius had a vision. Cornelius obeyed the words in the vision. Peter obeyed the words in the vision. That's why I call this sermon a tale of two visions. God knew Cornelius' heart. He always does. In addition to being devout, God-fearing, generous, and a man of prayer, Cornelius was a seeker. He wasn't satisfied with what he was doing spiritually. He had a sense that there was more. God places the hunger in our hearts. Hunger for more of him. I was going to see, I can remember and I can. But that hunger should never go away. So Peter heads for Caesarea with the messengers and some of the believers from Joppa. After a two-day journey, they get there. It was a ways. So far, we have seen the vision on both sides. Cornelius had an awesome vision. Peter had an awesome vision. Reading the rest of the chapter, we see how excited these people were. We read Peter's sermon, which God interrupted. <laughs> we see the miracle of salvation and the coming of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. Pick it up in verse 27. We're in Acts chapter 10. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. They were waiting to see what Peter would have to say. Cornelius had spread the news that a very important speaker is on the way. A fisherman. <laughs> I don't think that's what he said. A disciple of Jesus Christ himself is going to come and tell us about it. How exciting. A real witness, one who was there, is on the way. Come and hear what he has to say. And Peter confesses the attitude of his adjustment, his attitude of adjustment in verse 28. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew 
to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? He didn't know yet. Cornelius answered. Now these two were together. They had never met before. Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Can you imagine how excited they were? Here is the guy that was with Jesus. He's going to tell us something life-changing. Cornelius had three days to gather a crowd. He knew who was devout. He knew who was believers. Among, uh, among the Gentiles. He was a centurion. He was in charge of a hundred soldiers. Anyway, I had three days to gather a crowd who, like him, were anxious to hear about God's will for their lives. The first religion in which people who believe can have a personal relationship with God. And then Peter started a sermon. He began to speak in verse 34. He says, I, know real, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one whosoever who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the providence, the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of living and the dead. And the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him. They believed in him while Peter spoke the words. They came to believe, wrapped their hearts, in other words, around what Peter was saying. They believed immediately. All who heard the message received the message because they were ready. God interrupted Peter's sermon, pouring out the Holy Spirit on these new believers. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. They heard the message. They accepted the message. They believed. And they were made whole. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. 
Then Peter said, in other words, God interrupted him by pouring out the baptism of the Holy Spirit on these new believers. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Two visitations. Peter, a born-again believer, a companion of Christ. And Cornelius, a seeker, but a devout man. What a powerful victory was run. It was won. All those people in that house got born again and got filled with the Holy Spirit. The victory is God's. The actors, Cornelius and Peter, were in full cooperation with God, both in their own place and in their own way. God's messengers spoke to both of them. Angels we are God's messengers. Imagine what can happen if we carry the message. Imagine what can happen if we carry the words of life into dark places. Carry the light. There's dark places in people's hearts and there's dark places in the world. Imagine what can happen if we just carry the message. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? I'm done talking now. <laughs> I can smell the ham. Can you smell it? <laughs> so we'll go downstairs and fill our plates and fill our stomachs. And we'll go down there in a minute and do that. We might have to set some things out. I don't know. But anyway... God is good. Life is hard. But God is good. You can't out hard the goodness of God. We're on the way to heaven. We're going to go to his house. We're going to go move in with God. It's just so exciting and so amazing. It really is. Father God, it's been good to be in your house and with people of like precious faith. And as we anticipate our fellowship after church, we pray that you will bless the fellowship that we have with each other, that you will bless the morsels of food to our bodies, and um, just give us a good time down there in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know 